Help support Friendo Club by going to patreon.com slash Stephen Larson or clicking join at youtube.com slash Stephen Larson. Access to bonus episodes, question threads for the Going In Raw podcast, and entry to our monthly wrestling predictions challenges. Join the Friendo Club today. Hey, Friendo, Steve here. Hey, Larson. And welcome back to Going In Raw, the only pro wrestling podcast you need to be listening to on this episode. As it says in the notes right here on my phone, let's see here. Backstage details on CM Punk, Drew, Seth promo. That should be interesting. Mm. Nick Aldis feeling betrayed by all elite wrestling. Wow. Wow. See what he has to say about that. And then uh, on top of that, WWE apparently very happy with the director of the board. The Rock, we're going to talk about all that and answer your questions on this episode of Going In Raw. Hey, uh, let's start off with uh, these backstage details on uh, a mm. promo segment. They got a lot of conversation, a lot of uh, praise uh, by people that watch wrestling, specifically Monday Night Raw. We're talking about the segment where CM Punk, uh, Drew McIntyre, Seth Rollins are in the ring. We're in the ringside area talking to each other. <laughs> yes, that is what was happening. That is what was happening. Segment. So Fightful Select has some details. On that particular segment, which was fantastic, stating, quote, that uh, quote, there, there's a quote, not before. The claim internally was that there was a basic outline for that segment with Punk, Drew, and Seth. And Fightful was told that they were told to, quote, just go for it and see what happens. Wow. Fightful uh, was also told that production wasn't, quote, anticipating CM Punk's line where he cursed. And they also noted that talent were sent a memo recently that, Quote, discouraged them from swearing on the air. Seems like over the last few weeks, several did not get that memo. But I wonder if that's one of those things that was like, hey, from TKO front office, we're going to send this memo out to talent. Triple H looks at it and is like, eh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys, listen, just keep on doing what you're doing. You guys are doing great. If somebody, if there's a slip of the tongue, guess what? They could suck it. So, uh, yeah, you and I both sort of suspected that this was largely you could, improv. You could just tell by how it was it was structured and delivered that it seemed pretty clear. There was an outline, yeah. bullet points they were given, hit these beats. You mentioned that Drew's instructions were don't get in, in the ring with Phil, and Phil's instructions were do what you can to try to get Drew in the ring. Yeah, yeah, that's you what know, it really felt like. It's, it's a standard improv yeah, exercise. Yeah, it's a pretty basic thing. Um, and you get three three individuals who are immensely talented, who know their characters, and know how to deliver a story, speaking on the microphone, and it's really effective stuff. You got some good insults. You got some cool moments. You got you got some drama, and you we found out what Punk's uh, role at WrestleMania is going to be. Yeah. It's kind of like that, uh, you know, like when Liam Neeson and Ricky Gervais were doing improv. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like that. You're a green grocer, and you know you're you're closing, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, <laughs> yeah. Uh, less said about that, maybe the better. Um, uh, also, PW Insider had some something about how uh, the reaction backstage when when Punk made reference or was making a reference to Vince McMahon, yeah. according to PW Insider, is a Damn. hush backstage and then once punk moved on everybody's like ah all right yeah I, it seems like it was when i was like you know inhale gasps <gasps> everybody on the edge of their seat oh my gosh oh where is this gonna go oh okay all right Triple we're fine. H, it's fine but let's just move on just move on yeah just i know i know i know um you love don't you you kind of love to see this though like you know we're we're beyond the point where Everybody needs a script and everybody is working for the benefit of the story and true to their own character. Yeah. And I love to see that. And that's what made it so entertaining. And on top of that, there's always that element of these guys could crack. They could corpse at any moment now. Oh, they were very close at several yeah. moments. And uh and it was all it was all just really good, universally praised. Um, I thought it was I thought it was something that, you know, the world heavyweight championship. Ever since the Drew McIntyre stuff, especially, has really just sort of vaulted up in importance. Yeah. Uh, and, and this kind of stuff helps. You know, we talked about it on our, our Raw recap yesterday. I'm sorry if it sounds like a broken record, but I think it bears repeating. You have something, a segment like this, which felt alive, which felt yeah, alive yeah. and vital. And, and the progression through it felt organic. And you contrast that with the Cody Roman thing to close SmackDown, which felt very sterile and very scripted. Yeah, right. Yeah. And didn't feel like it had a spark of any sort at any point throughout the whole thing. And, you know, it, it was a very basic, 
can you trust your partner? Can you trust your partner thing? And neither of them are really affected by that argument. Mm -hmm. And so the, the segment didn't really lead to any sort of advancement in the story. Whereas this did. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. We get we get new layers to these characters and how they interact. We got, as mentioned, Punk's role at Mania. I mean, this it, it pushed things along. You know, dude, so I was thinking about this because I, I, I didn't watch the Roman Cody stuff. I didn't follow it on social media. I just knew that it happened. I knew somebody referenced, the, you know, the fan that was there that they mm -hmm. was caught on the hot mic. But, like, Roman Reigns' bloodline segments, when they're at their best... It you build up that little sense of of anxiety when you're watching something that's so good in entertainment. It's like, what is this guy gonna do? You know, the 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 peak of that was the Sami Zayn Roman yeah, yeah, Reigns yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. where you go into it and you're like, oh my god, I'm so nervous for this situation because you buy into it. Walking into this, I had that because I'm like, okay, what's gonna happen here? But it was like maybe three minutes deep into it where I was like. They're just sort of spinning wheels right now. And there wasn't even it's one thing to not have any story advancement, but also you just said it perfectly to not even have a moment where one of the characters is bothered. There's no tension there whatsoever. Whereas in the Drew Seth punk stuff, it was like, man, I don't know where this is going to go. I don't know where it's going to lead to. But I'm kind of riveted. I don't know. These guys are going to, they're saying everything right now. Yep, yep. Who called you the chosen one? Oh my God. Oh, what paragon of virtue gave you that title? Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that was memorable stuff. You know, even most recently, going back to Roman segments, that, that bit where he interrupted The Rock with yeah. his catchphrase. You know, that's, that's character development right there. You know, yeah. that's, that's, that's Roman's motivations, as generally speaking, but also as it relates to The Rock. He wants. His insecurities to 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 be, fed. to be fed, and he wants that acknowledgement from The Rock that Roman's still the top guy. When Ro when Roman wanted to leave and and just had to sit there while The Rock made his way out there, that's tension. Yes, that's oh shit. I don't yep. know how this is gonna play out. Yep. And yeah, we didn't get that on SmackDown, so no, they need to really. step their game up. Whoever's doing that stuff. Yeah. Yep. Uh, let's talk about this really quick. We're going to talk about SmackDown general manager Nick Aldis, who, if you remember, on SmackDown had a little conversation with Cody Rhodes. And, of course, back at, uh, what was it, All In, the first All In, not the, the Wembley one. one. The very, very first, first one. one in Chicago. Had a match with Cody Rhodes for the NWA World Star. Really good match, too. So, during an interview with Inside the Ropes, Nick Aldis was asked if he was upset that his career didn't reach the same heights as Cody Rhodes following their match at All In. He responded with this. I think in this business, if you start playing the comparison game, you can really go down a rabbit hole of bitterness and resentment very quickly. Side note, that is actually a very good piece of advice across the yep. spectrum for your life. Don't compare your shit against other people's shit because you, you got to base your, your metrics on your own shit. Yes. Uh, he continues here. I felt a little bit betrayed when I found out that they were all familiar. They were all aware of Tony Khan and they'd been sort of plotting this thing. AEW. as we progressed a couple of months forward, it was clear it was a done deal. So in that respect, I guess I felt I could have been informed of that sooner, but I just looked at it from the perspective of that piece of business, meaning Cody and I at all in did nothing but good things for all of everyone involved. It wasn't like people looked at me as if I were finished we tore the house down and we had the match that everybody remembers, the real main event of that show. That built, my, that built my credibility and off the back of that, we were able to launch an entire show that at that time had a strong, sustainable audience. I landed a six-figure contract off the back of that also. Cody obviously had the pipeline to a billionaire. I only had a millionaire, but whatever. It's all just part of the tapestry of your career. What a great perspective. Yeah. And at the time, dude, I remember there was a real palpable excitement over NWA yeah, product. Yeah. And his career easily could have taken off if NWA ended up taking off the way it may, maybe could have. I mean, there was some roadblocks there. There were, but I remember when Power uh, mm -hmm. uh, debuted on, on, on YouTube and there was some excitement about it. It was like, oh, this is old school studio wrestling. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, and, and yeah, you might think, well, it's a bit of a thing of the past, but compared to how slickly everything's produced these days on, on cable television, especially to have something that's a bit of a throwback to wrestling in the seventies and early eighties mm -hmm. was kind of a, a breath of fresh air. And then, yeah, there was, you know, various 
issues and roadblocks that kept that show maybe from growing more than I'm sure Billy Corgan hoped. Um, but there was this point there. What I mean? We were covering power for a few weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it was it was a breezy one hour watch. Yeah, it was. I liked it. Um, and docking for the theme song. I mean, up oh, into the fire. Exactly. So this is kind of interesting, though. He says, I landed a six-figure contract off the back of that also. I'm assuming he means with NWA. I would think so, yeah. I don't know what his contract situation was. It seems like the way he's speaking here, he had an opportunity to be with AEW if he had known about it at some point, maybe? Yeah, I'm not, I, yeah that, that, that part's a bit nebulous. I wonder if the, the, the little bit of betra- feeling betrayed is not being informed about where this was going. He could have been a big deal in AEW. Oh, yeah. I think he could have been. And that's the thing about Nick Aldis is still he's not that old. I think he's the same age as Cody. Yeah, he's in his mid-30s. Yeah. Um, and I'd be kind of shocked if he didn't end up wrestling in some way, shape, or form Eventually, in WWE. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's a big dude. He's WWE size. He's good in the ring. He's a great talker. Obviously, he's a great talker. He's got that charisma. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I wonder if... If maybe he had been clued in earlier, if the mm-hmm. issue is, well, I could have been a part of that yeah, company. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe Tony Khan was like, ah, you're too affiliated with NWA. Because, I mean, he was NWA champion for a very long yeah. time. And maybe that's why Tony Khan wasn't. I don't know. Because later on, during you know the, the first couple of years of Dynamite, there was NWA crossover. Thunder yeah, Rosa, Thunder Rosa on there, showed up yeah. as NWA Women's Champion. So I don't know if the affiliation with NWA in any way would, would have kept... Well, I mean, the fact that he was under NWA contract probably kept him from signing Nick Aldis to a deal. But otherwise, having him on the show more, I don't know. I don't know. Who yeah. Knows? Yeah. Unknown. Unknown. But uh, what uh, is, yeah, that's a wrestling what if right there. Exactly. What is known, apparently, The Rock yeah. is making TKO very happy. So Dave Meltzer he likes talking about this. Those other guys. Those other guys. Again. Just responding. Wait, he's still talking about this? He's still talking about this. Of course, the ongoing story of of an apparent double standard existing for The Rock. Rock says he owns The Rock IP. He's directed the board. He runs everything. He gets to cuss. Final boss. Everybody else sent a memo. No cussing. Right. So uh, Meltzer, again, responding to all that. And, of course, Russell Lamia's misinterpretation of Meltzer's initial report about all this and their aggregation of said report. So this is what Dave had to say via Twitter. Uh, quote, uh, probably would pay to read the actual article that's directed towards Russell Lamy, I believe. <laughs> I never said TKO was mad at Rock. They are, in fact, thrilled with him, but I did explain the process and how and why Rock can do what he wants while others are more limited. Rock was mad about a misleading post from someone else that stated something I never said. Do you think that's the extent of the Rock's discontent, Steve? Um, I don't know. I don't know what the rock, like what his interpretation of all that was. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Does the rock subscribe to the wrestling observer newsletter? Somebody in the rocks orbit almost certainly does. But does he get out the old visa every month? And, uh, you know, when it says, Oh, your, your, your payment did not go through because your shit's expired. I don't know about that. I don't know that he reads it. Somebody in his orbit. Ha- Brian Gowertz does. Maybe. Yeah. Almost guarantee Brian Gowertz does. It is, it's a really good, you know, I, I don't know if he reads it every week, but it, yeah. I think he, he probably has a subscription and it's there available yeah. for him. I would think nowadays where he's showing up on WB programming regularly, it's probably, I could see them want to gauge reaction, not just from fan base, but from wrestling media. Yeah. It's a possibility. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if Rock was referring to the entire idea that there are people within WWE upset or, uh, you know, believing there is a double standard for The Rock versus, like, you know, I don't know, Dijak or whatever. Maybe it's Dijak. He's like, hey, Dave Meltzer, I got a scoop for you. <laughs> Dijak's not happy. I don't get to say fuck. <laughs> I want to say fuck. Write that. You know how hard was it when I was attacking Tree? I didn't say it. <laughs> I, tra- I attacked Tree. I wanted to say you're a shithead, Tree. Um... Yeah, dude. I don't know. It, it look. Let's let's you and I. We take from all these, you know, wrestling journalists. Yes, and we give you guys our thoughts about yes. stuff. Yes, Meltzer is obviously one of the guys that we we take his reporting and then we break it down. Dun dun dun. Uh, and you know whether it's Hangman Adam Page's ankle really being hurt, 
to a variety of other things. Seth Rollins giving a rah rah speech in the locker room. <laughs> but dude, that was a while ago. Even this yeah. year, there's been a there's oh, been yeah. a couple L's. Oh yeah. In the reporting. Oh yeah. So I understand the guy's trying to you know save his. I still say, look, I still say, because I'm not trying to cost anybody money. Wrestling Observer on a weekly basis is a damn good read. Whether it's the you know his his extensive obituaries, his uh, yeah. uh, read on history, going back and checking out the archive, yeah. and seeing what the read on the news was then. Here, it's worth it just to read his uh, uh, breakdowns of matches when he does his old star ratings because sometimes he gets really snarky. He gives us his experience at the show if he was there. He talks about hot dogs. Um, Is that going in this week's guest yeah, the Meltzer? Yeah, it's okay. up right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, this week's uh, over at Friendo Club Wrestling, we got a guest the Meltzer going up, and uh, and yeah, Dave Meltzer talks about hot dogs at one of the WrestleMania shows, and it's fucking hilarious. It's pretty hilarious. Um, I still think the Wrestling Observer is a terrific uh, read, um, but it does seem clear that there's some stuff going on these days with WWE seems to be, you know, aiming to misdirect certain yeah. people. Yep. Um and uh and it seems to be affecting the reporting to a degree. That's that's my own personal opinion. That's my yep. own personal no, opinion. No, I I don't disagree with that. Just it's you know, we we mentioned the Justin Barrasso uh case yeah. where he mentioned that. Very uh, very upfront and honest about it, very transparent about, yep. hey, some people are trying to throw some curveballs out here. Yep. And it's not the new like WWE, but lately there does seem to be a more concentrated effort to do that. Yeah. Um, which is pretty interesting. It so, is interesting. Uh, so anyways, we're going to get to some of your questions here in just a moment. But man, Lars, check that. Look at this hat right here. Look what a this. hat. Look at this. We can't wear this because this this is, this is belongs to Muted May Day. Muted May Day is the current Big Blue Predictions Champion. And you can become the new Big Blue Predictions Champion by getting the Friendo Club set up. We've got this big predictions challenge coming up at WrestleMania Nights 1 and 2. It's a big event. Hopefully, we'll have over 300 friendos participating in the predictions challenge. So, if you want this awesome hat, you can wear it to like, you know, uh, your kids' soccer games, or you can wear it like uh, to the bar or to bowling or just out to the grocery store and to, and let everybody know that you are the Big Blue Predictions Champion. Oh, no ambiguity about it. Right, you've got the hat. Uh, so, if you want that, if you want access. If you want to try your hand at becoming number one predictor here at Going In Raw, then all you got to do is sign up for the Friendo Club setup. That's right. It's available for everybody. And we offer two ways to get there. Number one, clicking join right here at youtube.com slash Stephen Larson. It's $5 a month. Or go to patreon.com slash Stephen Larson. Clicking on the Friendo Club setup again. That's $5 a month. And not only do you get access to the Big Blue Predictions Challenge. Also, you get access to our bonus episodes every week. A new episode of FriendoCast where me and Larson, we sit here and we talk about not wrestling. Not wrestling. Nothing. This week, I think, am I bringing? Oh, you're no. bringing it to the table yeah. this week. I already know what we're going to talk about, too. Oh, nice. Awesome. I saw one comment from somebody uh, on one of our YouTube channels. Something. I don't know what it was. But they said, uh, at some point, I'd like to hear Stephen Larson talk about physics in the quantum realm. And so maybe... Next week, when it's my turn, we'll talk. I about mean, it. I've read a couple of Michio Kaku books, but I don't remember anything about it. Yeah, I tried reading a couple of Michio Kaku books, <laughs> and not only do I not remember anything about the first twenty pages of the book, which I read, I didn't read the entire book. Anyway, I think I might have got through an entire one, but half of it, I was like, I don't know what he's saying here. So, uh, if you guys want to hear more Stephen Larson bonus episodes exclusive to the Friendo Club setup, patreoncom slash Larson or click join right here at youtube.com slash Stephen Larson. It's a great way to help support going and Raw, and hopefully we provide you guys with uh, stuff that you want out of that. Yeah. From that. Yeah. Anyways, uh, also, yeah. of course, you get access to the question threads, and we're about to read some questions. But in the meantime, if you guys can drop us a thumbs up, a like, that'd be very much helpful. And hit that subscribe button yeah. and the notify bell, because yes. like today, we're uploading this video. Yesterday, we went live. WrestleMania, you guys want to be notified when we're going live for the watch along. So be sure to do that yes, as well. Please. Also, like I said, uh, Friendo Club Wrestling, today we got a new episode going up over there. It's Guess the Dave Meltzer Star Rating. Uh, you know, again. Oh, and it's a hoot. And it's a hoot because he talks about hot dogs. He talks about glizzies. He you does. Meltzer's a glizzy overdrive guy. I mean, 12 inches of glizzy. I would think yes. It's a little spoiler for you, everybody. Uh, question time. 
Man, a hot dog sounds good. I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't had a hot dog in a while. Just head over to Costco. Get yourself a glizzy. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Doc Hensla here says, what are your top three entrance themes currently in wrestling? Top three. Uh, all right. So, EO Skies is going to be one of them. EO's is good. I hate saying this. It's so cringy, but Brian Danielson's with all the right. lyrics. I all love right. that. I love that theme song. Um... Julia Hart's. I think she has the best That's theme, a good matching one. character, and provide improving atmosphere and aura for an entrance. I don't know if anybody's theme in that respect is better than Julia Hart's. It's so good. That is a really good one. It's a really good song too. Uh, let's see here. Who else? Who else are? They, who else is there? I'm trying to think of some. I mean, you know, Cody's is absolutely fantastic. Eh. It's so good. It gets that whole crowd going. It's really a work of art, if we're being honest about it. Yeah, there you go. Cody, what did I say? Cody, Brian Danielson, and uh, and then yeah, the first. Oh, EO. Yeah, yeah, I'll say Julia Hart, EO, EO. and... Oh, I love Judgment Days, too. That's up there. That might be better than Cody's, to be honest with you. If you believe. Yeah, yeah, I'll agree with that. Joe the Meme Maker says, if Cody was to make a new legacy... With new second slash third generation wrestlers from any company, any company, any company, who would be the best to recruit and who makes the most sense? Oh, he needs Braun Breaker in that group. In that group, I Cody like Braun. Joe the Meme Maker here calls him Brown Baker Breaker. <laughs> I think he got autocorrect. Yeah, Brown Breaker. <laughs> um, about David Finley. Oh, that's good. I've grown on David Finley. Yeah, David I Finley, Braun, cool. and Cody. How about Alex Hoglin having to retire? Yeah. That's, such, that's so that sad. That is a bummer. That is a I bummer. I like that guy. Charlie Dempsey. Have Charlie Dempsey. Oh, in that Charlie too. Dempsey's a great shout. Yeah, I, I, Braun's too big of a name. I would say I'd say David Finley and, uh, and Charlie Dempsey. Those are really good names. There we go. Those are really good names. Frozen Tape here says, which title should WWE bring back? Not the 24 7. Uh, didn't some cut, didn't NWA or somebody else have a brass knuckles championship? Oh, that's cool. That sounds neat. I would, After Logan Paul loses the U.S. title, he brings back the brass knuckles championship. I would do this. I would do, I would give the women the TV title mm. and, and do the Zack Sabre Jr. thing. You know, the, oh, the, the 15 time limit. Minute, 15 minute time limit. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that'd be that's cool. Good. That's good. That'd I like be that. neat. I like that. Uh, Andre Zimple asks, who is on your Mount Rushmore of comedy wrestlers? Oh, Truth is the, the George Washington. It's Truth. It's Yano. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Honestly, it's Kenny Omega. Oh, okay. Kenny is a really, really good comedy wrestler. He is a really good comedy wrestler. And then, I mean, Truth and Yano are like, yeah, they're like top tier. Would you put? Would you consider Orange Cassidy a comedy wrestler? Yeah, yeah. I I'd probably so. put him on yeah, there. To be yeah, honest yeah, with yeah, you. yeah. Yeah, I think you could consider uh, Orange Cassidy a comedy wrestler. Yeah. Austin Reed. Austin. Yeah. What says? I keep seeing rumors MJF is going to WWE. So let's look at the evidence here. MJF not on AEW's roster page, which I think contractually he would have to be if he was with AEW still. That's Maybe not true. Uh, and his, uh, more importantly and interestingly, his merch store is down, Yeah, which again, in my opinion is just misdirection. He likes to be, I think Meltzer reported on this that like MJF is basically being as quiet as humanly possible, yeah. which he did before also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course he's got this shoulder issue that he's dealing with, uh, which could be a serious deal and could keep him out for a very long yeah. time. Yeah. Um, but I think his like silence and the roster page and all that probably probably uh is is just to sort of you know make his return to aw more, more impactful. impactful yes but that's gonna cause rumors for people in, to say in the go to in the job. absence of information yeah rumors are gonna spring absolutely so, the question here is let's say he is all right if he is yeah who should his first feud be with cody. if he were to change cody right the main event cody because mm -mm, somebody he's got a MJF's got to win a couple feuds. Yeah, he he feuds with Cody, loses, has a number of feuds, comes back around to feuding with Cody, and then he wins that time. Uh, he mentions here Seth or Kevin Owens. Seth has got to stop being the gatekeeper. Yeah, no Seth. I'm gonna uh, here's three names: Bronson Reed, 
Shinsuke Nakamura, Ivar. Because <laughs> he can beat them all. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Cody's a good shout. Cody is a good shout. Cody. You just got to figure it out. You got to figure yeah. it out. Kevin Owens would be a good... I like Kevin Owens, though. Yeah. Kevin Owens is sort of... Or Sami Zayn. I think Sami Zayn would be a good first uh, feud for MJF, too. Kevin Owens. Yeah, oh, that'd be really good. Yeah, yeah. that'd be really good. Uh, Ty Moore here says, with Bad Boys 4 coming out, who would you say are the Bad Boys of wrestling? The answer's obvious. Wolfpack back, causing mad dis- or ma- mass destruction. Mass destruction. That's it. The Bad, bad, bad Boys, boys of, of Wrestling. wrestling. Bussing competition with your Yeah, that's Wolfpack. Bam, 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 bam. Those hi hat hits. Conan was so cool back then. <laughs> Tabula Rasa. Wolf, Wolfpack were, were were something else. Uh, Dave, they, they were why were they were so cool? They were like they had Lex Luger and Sting. They were so cool. It was that theme song. It was the theme. theme that went is a long that way. is such an underrated oh, theme so song. Good. It's so good though. It's so simple. Uh, David Matushik says since AEW is expanding their pay per view options to Triller, yeah, and YouTube in the U.S. for Dynasty. Hold oh, on a second. Could be on YouTube. YouTube. You can buy it on YouTube. That's news to me. I'm gonna have to use that. YouTube is incredibly easy to use. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you see Bleacher or is it going to be like for Ultimate Insiders? Yeah, maybe. Do you see Bleacher <laughs> how Reports? How many dollars a month for that one? <laughs> do you see Bleacher Reports eminence as pay-per-view holder decreasing? Yeah. I mean, it's, good. it's between now and Forbidden Door, I think it's going to be uh, available in pay-per-views on, on Triller slash Fight TV. I mean, ever since AEW started their pay-per-views and had them on Bleacher Report, it's, there's been problems all over the place. Whether it's like at the theaters where people still have to go through Bleacher Report and they're to order not able it. to, so yeah. they're just sitting there, everybody's on their phones. Yeah, uh, We've had a couple issues that that never like prevented us straight up from watching the pay-per-view, yeah. but um, it was still like, you know, kind of nerve wracking, like, oh, this thing isn't loading up. It's a, it's a, it's not a good interface. No, it's even, not. Even if it worked hella smooth, like even if it didn't have connection issues, the interface itself is really bad. Yeah. So I'm glad that they're changing over. Yeah, same here. Uh, Shaggy Two Cokes says, with WB making a point to make every title feel significant since Triple H took over, which title on the main roster feels the most insignificant and needs to be highlighted more? It's the women's tag titles. It's a possibility not even defended at WrestleMania. I would say, you know... Judgment Day carrying those tag titles hasn't really done a lot for the tag titles, I don't think. Like, they're always involved in other stuff like that makes it feel like none of those tag like the awesome truth are probably gonna win the raw tag titles at the very least. They might do the split thing. I anticipate the split. But I don't know. Yeah, the women who had it before uh damage control? Who'd they it win? Was, was it uh, the party girls? Yeah, it was Katana Chance and Caden Carter. Yeah, at least with damage control, it's in better hands, like more prominent hands. Yeah. But yeah, I don't think either of the tag titles are really, they're not held in the same prestige as like even the U.S. title. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Um, Heather Wright says, what new feuds do you see coming out of WrestleMania this year? Oh, interesting. Uh, Rock and Roman. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um. It wouldn't shock me, maybe, if Kevin Owens and Logan Paul reignited a solo feud. Maybe. 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 Do you think Backlash is going to be a bunch of rematches? I hope not. I mean, for so long, historically speaking, WWE, or WWE WrestleMania, the WrestleMania has kind of been the season finale. is where all the top storylines culminate. You Hopefully, know? we'll get a draft in between. Yeah, I know. The two. Mix things up a little bit. So, it, I, I anticipate some stories springing out of WrestleMania, but you got to think, you got to hope the top stories, you know, like the main event stories will kind of be wrapped up somewhat. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Jules E. Abril says, uh, who would you say, well, what's your match of the year so far? He says wow. his is Josh Alexander versus Will Ospreay from Tanay. I, uh, I have not seen that one, but mm-hmm. I've heard really good things mm-hmm. about it. My match of the year so far, we're in 2024. What what have we had? Uh, Osprey and Takeshita was really, really good. Danielson and Okada at Wrestle Kingdom was really, really good. 
Uh, hold on. A yeah, second. Osprey Takesh is really high up there. Hold on a second. Um, what did you say, Danielson? And what? Okada at Wrestle Kingdom is really good. Oh yeah, that was really good. Yeah, that was a good one. Are you gonna do your M O T Y thing? Yeah. All right. Docs at Elimination Chamber. Which match? Elimination Chamber was in contention. Was the men's chamber match up there? Uh, let's see here. Uh, Extreme Rules 2022. <laughs> Why no, you got to put you got to put 2024 on there, man? Oh, okay. 2024. There we go. I think the that. men's chamber match was that good. Why is it Revolution 2024? What was there? Was that Takeshita? That yeah, was Takeshita. That was Osprey. Takeshita Osprey. Yeah. That's probably gonna be the thing. But there was that was also kind of before Osprey. I mean uh, Okada Danielson. That's probably up there. Yeah, that was really good. I don't know. My memory is so bad. I'd have to go back and take a look. But those two really stand out. Yeah. I'll have to watch Ale uh, Josh Alexander versus Will Ospreay. I'm really looking forward to uh, to when Lord White gets his uh, title match in soft ground. <laughs> Lord White. It's so simple, yet so effective. It is very effective. It is very effective. Uh, oh, no. Jesse Helsia says, how is the feature-length short film coming along? Look, man, we got to... We gotta, oh, we got to do that. We got to figure out a script <laughs> for a short film. We just got to do it. Yeah. The feature's not going to work. Uh, Brandon Sign says, do you guys think the Netflix deal will push WB over the PG rating? Brandon says, I watch now with my five-year-old. And uh, and he loves it, but even with The Rock's recent return, I've been thinking it's a bit much. So it seems like the PG rating is a WWE policy, not necessarily one of their network partners. So it's entirely up to the company how they want to proceed in that respect. If they want to get a little edgier, what's it was a PG TV fourteen? That's the next rating up, right? Yeah. If they want to start doing TV fourteen. That's going to be up to them in terms of what they think is more beneficial to the bottom line of the company. They think it's continuing doing the PG route. That's what they'll do. So I think it's going to be a it's going to be one of two things. What Netflix wants versus what WWE, what kind of faith Netflix has in WWE's ability to make kind of their own decisions. This is a five billion dollar deal. It's a massive deal. They probably are aiming to get another five bills from, well, SmackDown's on USA. SmackDown's going to be on USA for another five years. Yeah. So that's not going to happen. But maybe a couple bills for Peacock when the Peacock deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, so yeah. Netflix has the entire library. So it's going to be like, hey, Netflix, what do you want? Or Netflix is going to be like, what do you guys think will work best because you've been doing that so long? Yeah. I think that's going to be probably the That'll push part and pull. Of it too. If Netflix is going to be like, hey, listen, we really think that you guys, that will be building the most buzz if we TV 14 it. If you guys, a little bit more language, that's what we would like to see. Yeah. Then I'm sure WWE like, hey, if you want it, you got it. You know, sponsorships, that's going to come in too. Like, oh, okay, yeah. but we have to be careful with this because sponsorships might... So it's it's probably going to be a lot of different push and pull there, you know. You know, I think Netflix plopped down five billion dollars to to get the programming that WWE is doing now because it's been reasonably successful. I think you're probably right. You're probably and, right and about that. Th they would probably be like, "PG's fine with us," mm -hmm. yeah, because in theory that opens the show up for the largest possible demographic, the broadest demographic. Yeah. On the other end, Netflix has that wonderful algorithm of theirs. Yeah. Like if you watch one thing, it could be like if they if they get the Peacock content. And they bring it over, and like everybody's watching ECW stuff. Okay, listen up, guys. This is what yes, we're going to need. Yes. Extreme. <laughs> uh, let's see here. World Wrestling. AJ Otani says, What's your I'm a casual to someone moment, wrestling or no? So, a moment where you think you know stuff, but you're actually a casual. Oh. Oh, that or even like, hey, you initiate a conversation with somebody and it's like, oh, man, this person knows way more. Even if you don't think you know that much. Oh, like, just yeah. about any topic. Oh, honestly. wow. OK, yeah. I'm honestly not that smart. OK, I'm All not right. that bright. I'm not as w well read as I used to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so largely any topic. High, fun I, high functioning dullard is what you're saying. Uh, yeah, I like to ask questions, too, especially if it's something I, I don't know much about. 
And so, because I like to learn new things. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it happens all the time. I recently had a conversation with a biologist over the COVID response. Oh, interesting. <laughs> it was it was interesting. I he, he gave me a lot of information to process, and uh, and I don't quite agree with a lot of what he said, but it was interesting and and well formed and educated. And I was like, okay, that's interesting stuff. Um, but yeah, that, I felt like a casual cause I was like, oh, pff, I'm no, I'm no science guy. Yeah. I'm not a scientist. Yeah. I like to hear, I'd like to read about science, but like, I'm not an expert. Uh, just a hippo here says, can you guys give the worst uh, possible stipulation for Cody versus Roman Gunther versus Sammy and Rhea versus Becky? The worst possible outcome or stipulation. Oh, Rhea versus Becky would be... I'm not going to say that. Um, what's a match for Rhea versus Becky? That'd be I hard. mean, in terms of Becky's story, which is she just keeps fighting and won't stop fighting, if they mm. made it an I quit match and had Becky quit, that'd be Ooh. such a letdown. Ooh, that would be... A, well, you know, that could be really powerful, though. It, it's either either really powerful or, or really underwhelming. To to have to have somebody of Becky Lynch's you know stature, Status, I know, be completely devastated by having to quit. I know. Ooh, but it could also be just utter letdown and underwhelming too. Uh, what's one of the other matches? Gunther. The stipulation where Gunther loses. <laughs> what if it was a submission match and he lost? That'd be terrible. For Cody versus Roman, that'd be the worst stipulation. The worst. I don't know why this sticks out to me, but Hell in a Cell. Nobody does. They don't do Hell in a Cell good. Oh, a cage match would be even worse. Yeah, a cage match. I mean, the only way you win is shit. imagine if Cody finishes his story by escaping the by cage. By leaving. I know. <laughs> by escaping the cage. <laughs> hey, we're going to put the cage up to keep the bloodline out, but to win, you have to escape. Yeah. Okay. I leave and I win. Yeah. Right into the clutches of the, the bloodline, you know? Yeah. Uh. Oh, no. Okay. So. Maybe they're new here, and that's okay. Mac O'Mac says, if WWE superstars were DC superheroes, who would be each Oh, a casting I question. I hate casting questions, but maybe this person, I don't recognize his name, and so that's totally New fun. name, new name, yeah. If WWE superstars were DC superheroes, so. You're more the DC guy than, than, than I am, so. I mean. I'm putting the onus on you. Okay. Uh, Seth Rollins is Batman. You know, I think The Rock would have made a killer Lex Luthor. Yeah. Batista, I think I think they should have cast oh, yeah, Batista, Batista instead of Nicholas Holt. I like Nicholas Holt, but Batista yeah, is Dave's Lex great. Luthor. Could you imagine him in that green, like that cool green suit that That'd he used something to sport? Else. That'd yeah. be awesome. Yeah. Um, I mean, Cody is Homelander, who's basically bad Superman. Yeah. So Cody's like half Captain. Cody is the amalgam Captain America Superman. There you go. What was his name? I think it was just Captain America, but it was like blonde haired Kal El, I think. Oh. It was something weird like that. I don't know. I got to read the book. Yeah, Bree sent us the book. Oh, that's right. The actual comic. That's right. Um, okay, that's the question I'm going to turn this into. Which amalgams are, uh, are, are WWE wrestlers? Who is the Wolverine Batman? MJF. He's short. His hair is kind of like Wolverine, and he's kind of a Bruce Wayne rich guy. Okay. Okay. And he's not a WWE wrestler, but maybe he is. I don't know. Those yeah. are my only two answers. There we go. What was uh, the Spider-Man one? Jade Cargill is the mix of Storm and Wonder Woman. Okay. It actually really yeah, works. That does really work. <laughs> what was the, the amalgam of Spider-Man? It was Spider-Man and Superboy. All right. I don't know his name. <laughs> Nathan Frazier. Super Spider. Maybe it was Super Spider. Oh, that's good. Nathan Frazier. It, it, it'd be Nathan Frazier and Axiom, but they're amalgam. There you go. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Samuel Raja, which wrestler over their career has had the worst merch? Seth Rollins. Yeah. Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins merch. I don't know if he's had a good shirt. Given the stature of Seth Rollins, how much he's done versus what his merch has been, I think he's clearly the winner. Yeah, I think so. His merch is just continually Awful. dreadful. Awful. Just horrible. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Uh, Remster says, which WrestleMania match build, I'm assuming he means this year, has been the most meh. To you, I'm gonna go with Logan Paul versus Randy Orton and Kevin, Kevin Owens. Owens. Kind of just thrown together, not really thrown together. They did the Elimination Chamber stuff, but I don't know. Yeah, that's probably the one. 
Because otherwise, the, the build's been pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I there's been aspects of the, the build of the tag team ladder match that, that has been good. I'm not huge. It's funny, but I'm not huge on 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 the 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 Gargano Champa just being oh. smiling baby face comedy guys. Yeah, the tag stuff has been weird. How they've like approaching? It's only really been entertaining because of our truth. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Anyways, uh, that's gonna do it for the show today, everybody. Hilton's right there. He's giving us the wrap up sign. He's like, "You better wrap it up, B." Listen. He's right there. Listen. I see his dumb face. There's no dumb face over there, smiling much less Hilton's. There's no one smiling. There is a wall. There is your desk. There's some storage. There's a fan. And that he, man's name is Hilton. No, that's, he loves us. That's so much. an inanimate object. That's not Hilton. He saw, he loves us so much. He's here doing it for free. <laughs> yes, Hilton. Would you stop referring to him as an inanimate object? I said it's not. No it. wonder you guys it's got it's not Hilton. It's an inanimate object. And even you say telling us to wrap it up, that's still cues. Damn it! Look, she's sleeping right now, and she's acting like she's like running or something. Yeah, dreaming. Yeah. Anyways, goodbye. Everybody. Goodbye, everybody.